So good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I am Ashwati Dilip, the lead for walking and cycling program at the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you, senior officials, engineers, project management consultants, community partners, and all other stakeholders who have also tuned in on YouTube to the third workshop of India Cycles for Change Challenge. Today, we will focus on the do's and don'ts for designing streets for cycling. So let me just very quickly take you through uh, the agenda for today's day. So first, we'll have Mr. Rahul Kapoor, the director of the Smart Cities Mission, who will deliver the introductory address. And there's a very important announcement coming your way, so please uh, stay tuned for that. Following that, we'll have discussion with officials from Rajkot, Nagpur, and Aizwal on the learnings of the cities from the handlebar surveys. This will be followed by the presentation for the day, Designing the Pilot by uh, Ms. Shreya Gadepali. She's the South Asia Program Lead for the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. And finally, I'll take you through the actions each of you need to take to keep the momentum going ahead. Now, before we jump in, I'd like to highlight a few housekeeping rules for everyone here. Participants and panelists feel free to chat and interact with each other in the chat box throughout the discussion. Type your questions, however, in the question answers uh, box. Our team will shortlist these questions for the Q&A session. And finally, if you like a question, you can also upvote it to bring them to our attention. Now, I'll keep this very quick, but let me just very quickly take you through what the different cities have been engaging in since our last workshop. It's been a fantastic journey already. Every time we receive updates from cities, we are amazed by the phenomenal and diverse engagement that each one of you have been able to kickstart um, to encourage cycling. So since the last workshop, cities have been riding ahead full speed. Cities like Mysore, Bhopal, and Bangalore organized rallies to support cycling. Newtown Kolkata organized a three-day cyclothon uh, with, with focused activities, especially for women. Children came together to visualize a beautiful cycling world in Jabalpur, and many cities organized meetings online and offline with their diverse teams to take their plans ahead for this challenge. The online cycling stories campaign launched on our Independence Day was a huge success as well. Next slide, please. It has brought to the forefront the emotions associated with cycling, from poems from the cyclists of Aizwal, to stories from children from Agra and Tumkaru, to everyday struggles and wins of daily cyclists and elderly from Sagar and Kohima. And in fact, in so many languages, it has been extremely heartwarming. Sure. And further, cities have also started taking action on the ground. 38 cities, including the panelists whom we have here, as well as Agartala, Hyderabad, Nashik, have had large groups of cyclists initiating handlebar surveys. And it's fantastic to note that 27 of them included even women and children to ensure that even their pain points are included in the survey. Some cities like Udaipur have got more information by talking to commuters while they went on their surveys. And some of them spoke to cycle repair shop owners. And some cities have also used videos to collate all of this information. All of this is coming to you more during our panel discussion. And in our panel discussion, we would have we have with us Mr. C.K. Nandani, the uh, Deputy Municipal Commissioner of Rajkot, Mr. Lal Ra uh, Rotanga, CEO Aizwal Smart City Limited, and Mr. Mahesh Moroni, CEO, Nagpur Smart City uh, Sustainable City Development Corporation Limited. But before we go into any of that, coming over to you, Rahul Kapoor, sir, I'm sure you're very impressed with the progress of our cities, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So without uh, any more delay, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Rahul Kapoor, the director of the Smart Cities Mission, to deliver the introductory uh, address. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Aswati. In fact, Indeed, this is one of the most exciting work that the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and especially the Smart Cities Mission has undertaken. Cycles for Chain Challenge is one of those challenges which does not really require a push from the Ministry. In the past, we have come up with a lot of initiatives and many a times I find that me and my team are really struggling to motivate or inspire the cities to come and participate. But here is one challenge which does not require any of those. 
it is something which is already getting traction from the cities on their own they are the ones who are asking us questions trying to understand from us in fact telling us and giving us a lot of insights and learnings on how to do this thing better this is the third in the series of workshop and each of these workshops have brought out very interesting points very interesting discussions and amazing case studies and stories from different cities and i'm sure today we will be actually will listening to some really interesting insights that the city of nagpur rajkot and as all will be throwing up over the last few months ever since we launched this challenge we have seen that more than 40 cities have actually launched their campaigns and rallies to engage the citizens from around the country which is an excellent effort the kind of momentum it has gained in just a few months of time and with 22 cities having shared their personal cycling stories to celebrate their independence we just had the 15th august celebrations and a lot of cycle rallies and cycle led initiatives were undertaken by these cities we had more than 50000 responses being received to understand the barriers of cycling so i am sure that this will quickly initiate the dialogues and effective interventions to make cycling safer for all in this direction we have 25 cities that have already identified the routes and conducted handover surveys so i am sure this number is getting updated uh, whatever information that i have and in order to further build the momentum we are also taking other innovative initiatives and the cities have basically organized cycle races to create cycling spirit as has been done by pasighat drawing competitions have been organized to create awareness to trying to make it more inclusive on making it more uh, friendly for disabled on how you can have a cycling rally for disabled persons as antabad has demonstrated creating open webinars on cycling just like the series of workshops that we have been doing agartala has taken a lead on that and heritage walks like the city of pal has taken Uh, for cycle ride so these are very heartening to see the kind of work that is already taking place and it's good i mean when i leave from office and i see the number of cyclists that we see on the roads of delhi and that has increased which is a very positive sign so i guess we are all moving in the very right direction with regard to this initiative i am happy to hear the update that nearly 50 cities have formed their diverse teams in coordination with the various stakeholders like cyclist groups and experts to strategize their solutions so of course i will not take too much time today we have three of the smart cities aizol nagpur and rajkot who will be sharing their learning so far from identifying of locations and conducting the handlebar surveys on ground what kind of challenges these people uh, these cities face and it would be great to see that cycle for change team has going side to side and they are moving themselves the ceos have been on the ground the entire teams have been on the ground to understand and empathize what struggles cyclists face on day to day commute so let us hear from their experiences and also understand and learn from them as to other unique engagement methods that they have been working on as part of this challenge and seeing this momentum and excitement from the cities there is one important announcement that i would like to make that earlier we had the final date of submission for stage 1 which has been increased to 14th of december 2020 so as to give cities more time uh, to design and test impactful pilots we don't want you to do a very quick job and come up with shortcut solutions we want these uh, these improvement interventions to be uh, more impactful having more of a long term impact on the way citizens perceive their cities and the way people commute so we can't wait to see more such initiatives and participation from all the cities i urge everyone to use this platform of online workshops to raise as many questions and try and learn and understand and pose even if it may sound something like very basic or very rudimentary please feel free to post your questions and ask them because believe me it is something new that we are trying to do and there is a cycle to reinventing the wheel we are going through that there was a time when cycling was very popular then it went down and now thanks to the covid situation it's an opportunity that uh, people are taking more and more interest so it is again a time of learning for us how to make a city more cycle friendly so with that aspati i think i will stop here and i would like uh, to give the floor to the cities who would be very eager to share their experiences so far thank you thank you so much sir and uh, thank you for this exciting announcement as well and i'm sure that with more time available to our cities uh, we will have a lot of impactful pilots coming up our way now as you as you mentioned uh, moving quickly over to the panel discussion once again it's my pleasure to invite today's 
panelists, Mr. C.K. Nandani, Deputy Municipal Commissioner Rajkot, Mr. Lal uh, Rotanga, CEO, Icebald Smart City Limited, and Mr. Mahesh Moroni, CEO, Nagpur Smart and Sustainable City Development Corporation Limited. Now, before we hear very quickly, before we hear from our panelists themselves, let me just very quickly take you through what is it that has been so special amongst uh, these panelists. So, as well as you can see, had a huge army of uh, you know stakeholders who went on to their site and uh, did the handle uh, bar surveys. And what you should identify also is that they've had women and even young children as a part of this particular uh, group. Uh, they did active engagement on social media, including they had many, many stories even from their children. Secondly, Nagpur, while they were conducting their handlebar surveys, they spoke to cycle vendors, traffic police, shop owners who were, uh, uh, who were present on their uh, routes as well. And they've now identified about 17 kilometers of cycle lanes uh, for their pilot testing. Rajkot, in fact, what you know, they have looked at, um, they, they first, after the second workshop, they identified various potential routes for pilot intervention based on, uh, you know, uh, based on citizen responses. And the handlebar survey was conducted on routes on different days and different timings. So that was very special. And they also took the group, um, support of their cycling group volunteers to share their feedback. And finally, very importantly, they used various digital applications in order to map all of this. So let's go straight uh, to the cities. And now, since I'm at Rajkot, let me um, uh, you know, talk to you, uh, sir. So the first question that we'd like to hear from you, Nandani, sir, is that what was the approach uh, that the city had taken to conduct uh, the handlebar survey, and how has the experience been? Can can we hear from you what your thoughts are? Mr. C.K. Nandani, sir, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you please repeat the question? Yes, sir. So I was saying that, you know, while you all were doing your handlebar surveys, uh, you know, uh, you all had all of these innovative uh, ways of, you know, doing the surveys, different timings, different days, etc. So what was, you know, what were, what were all the things that you thought through while you all were doing your surveys? And how was the experience of conducting the handlebar surveys, sir? Yeah, because... Uh... In fact, uh, we had started, and just give you a brief background. Uh, we had started cycling project long back in 2012, where along the 13.5 kilometer BRDS route, we had created a cycle track. Uh, but then uh, that was hardly used till now. Uh, then probably we thought that uh, there was a need to promote cycling in the city. So we did a couple of marathons and all of them were very successful. We did a lot of cyclothons. They too were successful. We started an incentive scheme for bicycle uh, purchases that whoever purchases a bicycle in the city, he or she will get a th uh, subsidy of rupees 1000 from the city. But till then, the routes were not used. Like now, we saw a very huge uh, increase in purchase of bicycles in the city. But people were preferring outer roads, say ring roads, uh, for uh, rather than the city. Very few people were uh, using it for uh, work to home, uh, home to their office. Uh, then probably this handlebar tool, uh, we found it very important just to understand why were people not using the cycle tracks. Uh, I myself am a cyclist and I personally went uh, many times on the routes just to understand why how what difficulties do cyclists face though i i was not a, officially a part of the handlebar survey and then my survey was carried by a few members of the team uh, urban planner one engineer and a few cyclists volunteers uh, as you see in the picture uh, the 13.5 kilometer brts route is important because it is one of the uh, highly successful uh, route in terms of uh, traffic density we are having highest ridership probably in the country on this small BRDS route. In fact, along with that, even the TOD uh, is very successful. We have earned more than rupees 500 crore out of this uh, corridor. 
and still we are earning probably will be earning much more than that in the years to come so this was probably the most ideal route for any uh, last mile connectivity but still it was not working so handlebar survey the approach taken was we try to use it in the mornings in the afternoon and in the evenings mornings the findings were that uh, there were a lot of garbage is on the road those cities well uh, equipped to handle the garbage uh, we found lot of encroachments uh, some were permanent that was uh, something very serious for us some were very temporary people were parking cars on them there were vendors uh, probably early in the morning again afternoon uh, there were similar issues evening again there were issues of lesser street lights again some uh, food courts uh, food carts uh, encroaching it uh, then we uh, use a application called strava which is very popular among cyclists and uh, that probably gave us some more insight uh, probably in one of the previous sessions uh, we were shown how uh, a country in you uh, a country had done a survey with help of technology we didn't have that much uh, technology with us but we probably went with a simple free tool which was available but that gave us a, on less, a lot of insights on say blind spots on the junctions potholes which look very normal but for a cyclist it is really troublesome uh, so and so uh, now probably we'll be working more on how to improve the ridership quality how to how do we improve the ride quality for a cyclist and now we are trying to promote uh, work to office uh, home to office uh, riders sure so thank you so much thank you you know, uh, for all of those uh, insights now moving on from uh, from rajkot and uh, you know uh, moving on to let's say aizwal uh, so you know um, in aizwal you have had women children etc be a part of the handlebar surveys as well so could you let us know how your experience was uh, having such a diverse uh, group and what were some of the feedback that you heard from them as well over to you sir thank you ma'am uh At the outset, I'd like to congratulate the government of India, bro, for bringing up such a wonderful program, which we haven't thought of. Of course, this might be an outcome of COVID-19 as well. Uh, see, Aizawl is a very, very hilly city, and uh, right from childhood, we never thought about cycling outside. But uh, as uh, uh, done in other parts of the country, the boys and the girls, when they come to the age of five, six, seven, the first thing they ask is cycling. for the you know but they give another thing but cycling is normally restricted to within the premises of the house you know so they have not been coming out on the street and nobody thought that it's going to be uh, like what we are doing now and we never thought that it's it's going to be a part of the public transport system we thought that this is just a just a hobby so when we talk about this uh, beautiful program the boys the girls and the youths you know they are very very excited and they are very very um, uh, excited about having the whole system in place in aizawl so we have another um, benefit here in aizawl we have a very strong network of cyclists here in aizawl they have been traveling uh, throughout the states for a long long time with their strava on their cycle and they have been doing this for a qu quite some time but uh, as i said we have some constraints so we will come to that later on but as far as the survey is concerned we are, are doing the surveys in two phases number one is we are engaging the cyclists both those who knows the road those who have been doing it i mean practically for quite some time so we have taken this abd and pan area aizawl is uh, you know the road is going on a north south direction so we are trying to cover the eastern side the spine and the western side of aizawl city that means the 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 benefit of the cycling is going to be very huge and enormous as uh, as and when these things have come up to i mean the the real real life situation and as you said the, the children and the, even the girls the ladies and the youth have come up 
they have participated in the, in the survey and uh, we have got lots of feedback and they have been very, very pleased, not only with Smart City, but with the government of India for bringing up such a wonderful program. We hope that we are going to be successful in this run. And we thought that, uh, you know, uh, we will be one of the um, uh, first city among the hills to come up with, uh, you know, uh, cycle for I mean, uh, change and bring about a change in public transport, madam. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. That was a that was very good insight. Um, and coming over to you, uh, Mahesh, sir. You all have, you know, also worked with um, vendors and traffic police and shop owners. So, how has this experience been in Nagpur, sir? Please show, uh, share us some insights about how the handlebar survey. What was your approach taken uh, in 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 Nagpur? Aswathi. Yes, sir. We had started our survey much before your handlebar survey form reached us. Because you know, Nagpur is the heart of the country. So everything should start from the heart. Because unless the heart works properly, then uh, the body will not work properly. So Nagpur is ahead in everything, let me tell you with pride. We have uh, formed the core committee much before. The moment this India Cycle for Change Challenge was launched. And this core committee is, uh, in itself is diverse, comprising of uh, the bicycle mayor of Nagpur, Dipanti Pal, then uh, the deputy commissioner of police traffic, Nagpur, then the enthusiasts who are enthusiastic about uh, cycling, various uh, uh, cycle club members, they are the part. They are, of course, collaborators, but we take help of all those people. And I would like to tell you the most innovative thing uh, we done is our COVID uh, Wi-Fi areas under the roof, which we were contemplating. Uh, we use the database uh, of the people who are using our Wi-Fi services through our hotspots. So physical survey that is on-site survey as well as survey through contacting people by getting their mobile numbers. So we did the survey very quickly. I think within a week's period, we completed our survey and we could identify 18 kilometer roads where we can go for uh, dedicated bicycle lanes immediately. So uh, that is the, I think, uh, very good uh, initiative by Nagpur city. Then we chose West and uh, Southwest Nagpur portion because here the people are fond of cycling. They go, they use uh, cycles for commuting also. So this route is uh, surrounded by uh, educational institutions, educational facilities. It is surrounded by hotels. It is surrounded by colleges. So, and uh, government offices also. So, this route will be very, very useful as a pilot, this 18 kilometer route. And our uh, team members, core team members, plus all the staff members of Nagpur Smart and Sustainable City Development Corporation, we had a ride on this 80 kilometer route to know what are the various problems faced, what are the uh, rectifications need to be done. All these things we jotted down and then we we are uh, coming out with strategy to remove all these obstacles and this route will be used by so many people. Our target is present. We, we are fortunate to have comprehensive mobility plan in place for Nagpur city which was prepared by UMTC in 2018. So identification of route was helped by that CMP to, great, to a great extent. And uh, we will uh, ensure that this route will presently, we are having 6% uh, of the people who uh, use cycles. Our aim is to reach 22% by 2022. That is our aim. That's fantastic, sir. That's, uh, you know, we really 
look forward to uh, seeing this actually transition into reality. And so I think you spoke about like a couple of very, very important points and I'd like to just reinforce that. So one, you were talking about the diverse team that you have, um, you know, including traffic police, the cycle mayor, um, etc. As as well as the various volunteers you've brought on board and I'll actually uh, uh, nudge all, uh, encourage all cities to reach out to such diverse volunteers and team members because they would really help you in making your strategy and your pilots a lot more successful uh, as well. So yes. uh, from here, so we'll just uh, also take one round of uh, another round of questions where I'd like to hear from each of you all a little more uh, about the kind of pain points that you're actually uh, identified on the site. And here, uh, I'd like to come to uh, Mr. Lal uh, Rotanga, sir, from Aizwal first. If you could share some of the key pain points that your team had identified so that the rest of the team and the cities can also get inspired. Yes, sir, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam. Uh, what we have intended uh, as far as the survey is concerned is so we are trying to cover as much community as possible. Uh, we are covering around 30, 35 uh, uh, local councils. But of course, we have got uh, problems here and there. Uh, like uh, all other hill cities, the roads here in Aizol is narrow, number one. It's winding and, you know, the, the it's very, very undulating, number one. And there is no proper place for parking the cycle. And of course, we don't have a separate lane for cycling and it may be a little bit challenging to do that. And the street lights are not in a good condition. Of course, this will be taken care of under Smart City project. Then it's, the roads are narrow, congested, and uh, we need to do a little bit of uh, you know, adjustment here and there. And, there needs to be some sort of a dedicated lane for the cycle for the cyclists of course this is going to pose another challenges but then the thing is that uh, in spite of all this uh, you know pains that we are covering and we have identified we are very very positive that we'll be able to make it up that is one because the the, the excitement and the encouragement from the public is so huge that uh, see looking at the thing now the cycling, of course, this achieved, and the carbon footprint is going to be less, and is going to have a very positive impact on the personal and general and uh, community health as well. So we feel that uh, we will be able to overcome all these, you know, uh, key difficulties and key points that we have encountered during our uh, survey, madam. Sure, sir. I mean, that's, yeah, the whole idea of what we wanted was that if you identify actually what the key pain points are, then we could try to resolve them and as a result, make them useful uh, for our users. And I'm sure with all the excitement, we can definitely ensure, and with the city's support, uh, we can definitely ensure that this becomes a success. So very quickly, over to you, Mahesh, sir. So what were some of the challenges that your team had identified? Because you said that, you know, you all have been doing surveys even prior and you all have also been reaching out uh, to cyclists as well. So if you could share some of these uh, pain points, are they similar to the ones in Aizwal? Are they different? Over to you, sir. Like, uh... we can't, yeah. We couldn't hear you because you were on site. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. You're very, very clear. Okay. So, Nagpur is fortunate to have good infrastructure like uh, wide roads and all that. So, our uh, municipal commissioner mm -hmm. has uh, made a provision of rupees 5 crore for making the city by, uh, uh, walk, uh, I mean, pedestrian friendly, that is walkable and also bicycle friendly. So, that is number one. Secondly, when we went for a survey, we came to know that the most important factor is the safety. Since there are no dedicated bicycle lanes, people are having a fear to uh, ride a cycle. That is number one. Secondly, there is a problem of uh, parking. There are no separate parking uh, lots for uh, bicycles. Then, of course, you know, the traffic rules violators are there and because of them also road safety is the major concern. Then last important point is status symbol. People are not ready to use bicycle because of the status symbol. Oh, that should be used by poor people only. That is not uh, my cup of tea. That is how the rich people think. And last but not the least is lethargy. 
try to use bicycle lethargy i think is the most important factor which is the barrier i can say for people to go uh, to go for using uh, bicycle but uh, i am confident that uh, after talking to the people from all walks of life we will get rid of all these problems and this 18 km stretch we will be ready with this stretch before october the deadline given by you for the first uh, stage of the challenge and i would like to add one more thing which is again an innovative we are doing all these things through the corporate social responsibility fund will not be spending a single pi from our kitty nssc dcls kitty i would like to share you that uh, we have already received 10 good quality bicycles through this csr activity 90 are in pipeline we have already been committed 10 lakh rupees for uh, the creation of this pop up lens we have already been uh, 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 given uh, word that around 1 crore rupees will be given for all these activities through the csr uh, uh, fund one it company has assured us again we have devised a strategy every saturday we are organizing an event we are calling uh, builders association on one saturday we will be calling architects association on one saturday we will be calling indian medical association people on one saturday will be calling uh, students will be calling pra- public representatives every saturday 7 to 8 30 there will be an event for uh, i mean uh, having a they will ride a bicycle on this route only and they will uh, will come to know what are the problems faced and we will be will go on to rectify the things that uh, will uh, come across in the future Yeah, yeah, now I think I'm muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, it was it was really interesting to also hear about the CSR funding because it is very important for us to attract innovative funding mechanisms as well. And as you moved ahead with design and uh, community outreach, etc., it's fantastic to also know that you are uh, attracting all of these um, uh, all of the CSR funding as well. So before we close the panel discussion, let me just go once again to uh, Mr. C K Nandani. Uh, so you did mention about a few of the challenges that uh, you know that you had faced while you were doing the uh, handlebar survey. Is there anything else uh, that you would like to add on this uh, particular uh, section, and also speak about you know any benefits of including like women, children, etc. in the survey as well? So are you there, sir? Yeah. Yeah, I'm there. Uh, yes. uh, uh, in fact, we did include uh, women and children. uh do uh, probably shaya ma'am would not be happy with the ratio of participation uh, uh it was 82% male and uh, rest of them were females but probably we are now very serious on it and uh, we have onboarded a uh, few female uh, like say pink pinkathon ambassadors and all just to ensure that our uh, gender ratio is at least 50% and probably by month and probably i'll be able to do it uh, children also because of covid and city is facing a peak covid uh, rise uh, presently so we are not uh, having any events but uh, very soon uh, we are planning uh, because all the kids are uh, getting uh, education via zoom so we have contacted almost 500 pub, uh, private school uh, and uh, probably we'll be having small sessions with them Say of oh, 10 to 15 minutes, and probably there we'll take uh, their uh, view on that. We'll probably include children on board or by that way. Thank you, sir. That's fantastic. So it was it was really nice hearing from all uh, you know the three different cities. So thank you once again, Mr. Nandani sir, Mr. Lal Gotanga, and Mr. Uh, Mahesh sir for for taking your time out and sharing your thoughts with the rest of the cities and inspiring them. So like we've heard from uh, these three cities, it it's become uh, pretty clear that the handlebar survey has helped these teams identify the key issues faced by everyday cyclists and. Uh, 
some of the key uh, just highlighting once again some of the key issues that had come up so fear of riding the cycle and uh, on account of safety particularly or the roads being very narrow potholes um, and lack of a smooth surface and uh, you know also coming into lack of street lighting so first of all i would request all the cities those who have not yet initiated these surveys to go ahead and initiate them because it's very very essential and um, in order uh, you know to to actually hear more about what are the next steps and how you can uh, design the pilots i'd like to uh, invite Mr. Shreyadipali, the South Asia Program Lead of ITDP. Shreya, over to you. Shreya, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sure. Uh, Aditi, uh, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, I can share my screen. Sure, Shreya. Thank you. So that was a great panel discussion. Thank you, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mahesh uh, from Nagpur, Mr. Nandani from Rajkot, and Mr. Lalo Tanga from Aizol. Uh, it's great to see all this good work being done by you. And, uh, you know, we, we are very uh, happy to see the level of interest that each one of you have shown in uh, making cycling the new direction of mobility in your cities. So let's go through a little bit about, uh, you know, what the design of streets themselves should be. But uh, let's start first with, you know, where we are. So in the challenge map, uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, no, Shreya. Oh, Shreya. Um, I can see it as, as being, sh just a sec. Can you see it now? Yes, 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 Shreya. Great. So uh, this is where we are in the challenge map. We are somewhere midway. Uh, and as you saw earlier, you already rolled out the perception surveys to find out what people are thinking in your cities. You identified neighborhood and corridors, potential neighborhood and corridors where you could implement uh, the, the various uh, pilots in the city. And finally, uh, it's great to see all the handlebar surveys that we've seen from across the country and identify the pain points. So now using this information that you have gathered from the ground, uh, today we will start the process of designing the pilot. So the next three stages of the process is essentially about designing the pilot, testing it on the ground and measuring the impact uh, and documenting the impact of the pilot. And what we will focus on today is primarily about how do we design the do's and don'ts of good cycling infrastructure, a good cycling environment. So in today's session, we'll have three pieces. The first one is what is the process of testing a pilot? Uh, second is the actual designing of the pilot itself. And lastly, we would speak, uh, we will look into the building the momentum of, uh, of, of cycling itself across the whole city. So that's beyond the pilot, but it's about getting more citizen support in your city to continue the momentum that you've built. So the process of testing the pilots, and I'd say that there are actually five parts to it. The first one is documenting the site, which is what you've done so far by actually going out on these handlebar surveys, noting down what the pain points are and what the problems are and how to develop the design. Today, what we're gonna do is to look primarily at developing the design and how do you organize community reviews to ensure that the plans that you develop has, are, are robust and have the support of the community. In the next session, we will look at testing the designs on ground, how to go about it, and finally also measuring the impact because how would you know if what you've implemented is successful or not? And that's why measuring the impact, impact becomes an extremely important component. Now, you had already, you've all gone out on uh, you know, handlebar surveys and you've looked at pain points. So let's look at an example of what, you know, we, we also did a similar survey ourselves so that we are clear about how to go about doing a process of handlebar surveys and mapping pain points. And if you see on the right side, you would see a series of various kinds of pain points. The first set that you see primarily are, is about traffic and safety. The second set, which are all in red, A, B, C, D, and F. And then E and G are essentially the 
fear of uh, you know encountering probably stray animals or undesirable activities and such in the city uh, when you go around and lastly you have other things like you know how you manage the traffic are there other kinds of obstructions so when you actually go out on uh, a handlebar survey and these are all the various kinds of handlebar surveys that we did ourselves uh, to check out in a certain neighborhood uh, and each of the colors that you see are different handlebar surveys we found a variety of pain points and we mapped at each location what the pain points are for example if you see the pain point a it's about fast moving traffic at an intersection which makes it a very difficult uh, point similarly if you see the point g it's about undesirable activities happening on that stretch which especially make it difficult for women to travel on that stretch on a cycle at night time and so on and so forth so after you map the pain points we would say identify what are deal breakers because not all pain points are the same some pain points are really deal breakers if you do not address those deal breakers it makes cyclists completely avoid cycling on that route and if you have enough number of deal breakers in a neighborhood you would make essentially the neighborhood uncyclable so let's identify what these deal breakers could be and the whole idea is it's about prioritizing action because you might have identified maybe 20 pain points in a neighborhood but you might realize that if you were to address four or five of them which are extremely critical you would actually make cycling safer for the large part in that entire area it could be a very unsafe intersection or dangerous traffic movement uh it could be unsafe activities which are happening at night which make that area unsafe especially for women uh and lastly also very fast moving traffic running right next to you which makes it very difficult for you to actually go on that on that route so if you see now each of the deal breakers have been mapped uh marked also with a yellow circle around it so the next process would be as you start mapping these points you would reflect on what the level of pain was the intensity of pain and identify the deal breakers and once you've identified the deal breakers as we have done in this map you would go to the next process of finding solutions so this is the first part of it the next is designing the pilot itself so what would we address in designing the pilots this is not a comprehensive guide right now and we will be sending you a more comprehensive guide of designing the pilots in the coming week but this is a sneak peek at some ideas on how to design it right and i'll address three critical points today the first one is cycle track basics how to get cycle tracks right the second is calming the neighborhood how do you calm neighborhoods to make that entire neighborhood safe and third other design elements such as especially intersections lighting and such so let me jump into cycle track basics first so in cycle track basics often times cities make the mistake of creating just a painted cycle track that's unsegregated now the problem with this as you can see in the picture on the right and you would have probably seen in many places is that other traffic tends to just come and occupy this space so this doesn't quite work so even though you've marked it it doesn't quite work so what the right design would be is to actually physically segregate it at the very least make the segregation you know using bollards temporary bollards or other forms of segregation so that the cyclist is safe from moving traffic so that's the first step as a temporary intervention then in the longer run when you make it a permanent inter intervention make sure that you're also looking at how can you physically make that physical segregation even more permanent and also look at raising the cycle track and the footpath also for a variety of other issues such as drainage for example so this is what you would do to segregate a cycle track how you segregate it right the second point that i'd like to address with the issue of segregation is even if you have a segregated cycle track as you can see in the picture on the right if you do not have enough space for walking or no space for walking the cycle track becomes the walking space the cycle track becomes the walking space so the right way to go about would be to ensure that there is a walking space and only after that do you create a cycle track without the walking space the cycle track is not going to be successful 
and we have guidelines. We will be sending the guidelines on what the dimensions of these would be when, you, when we send you the guide next week. But the basic point is inadequate walking space means a dead cycle track because the cycle track becomes the footpath. And when you make it a permanent intervention, of course, look at even widening the footpath further, looking at other elements. And again, the guide would address those points. Third is where do you place parking? Many, many cities, including European cities and American cities, make the mistake of placing cyclists between parking and motor vehicle traffic. So what happens is the cyclist essentially becomes sandwiched between parked vehicles and motor vehicle traffic. That's a very dangerous space to be because the park vehicles which want to park constantly keep intruding into the cycle track. And also there are things like getting doored. For example, when, when somebody is coming out of the car, your cy the cyclist goes and hits the, the door and that can create a terrible accident for a cyclist. So what you should do instead is swap the location of parking and cycling. Place cycling next to the footpath, place parking next to the carriageway and ensure that there is a, a segregation between the two. So as you can see in the picture on the right, now what you have is easy access for motor vehicles to access parking without having to cross the cycle track. And then parking also becomes a buffer of sorts between uh, cyclists and motor vehicle traffic. So the cycling space becomes much, much safer. And eventually when you make it a permanent intervention, think about how you could widen that space, the segregator uh, itself and a variety of other components, again, which we will address in the design guidelines that we will give you. So remember, parking next to traffic, cycles next to footpaths, right? That's the primary idea here. So in managing the curb, there are a variety of issues that would come up. There are issues like even where do you place the bus stop, for example? Where would the motor vehicle parking be, but where would also the cycle parking be? Uh, where would other things like seating and vending, which could be there? And Typically, what you would do when you're doing a permanent intervention of a cycle track, you would try to take the cycle track behind all these activities which are towards the traffic. For example, a bus stop needs to be next to the traf traffic lane. Parking of motor vehicles needs to be next to the traffic lanes. So put cycle track behind it. But we understand that when you're trying to do a, a quick intervention, you do not have the ability of defining all of these. So you would have to take other ways of addressing the same thing. So what would you do? At the place where you have a bus stop, you would have to slow down the cyclist so that the interface between the pedestrians who are trying to access a bus and the cyclist becomes safer. And similarly, other components that you would look at, for example, you know, where would you place the vending or the seating, et cetera, which you would try to get reclaim that space to create additional seating or vending or even space for walking for that matter. So that's the basics about how do you create a safe cycle track, a working cycle track. Let, next, let's look at calming the neighborhood. So many of you, like you not only went on a handlebar survey on a corridor, but you also did handlebar survey of a neighborhood. So what would you see in a neighborhood? Oftentimes what happens is there are a whole bunch of local streets that you see in gray and the orange streets are the largest streets where you also have public transportation and such. But even the gray streets, the local streets start acting as if they are thoroughfares because one can easily pass through them, which makes neighborhoods unsafe. And you would have probably pointed, found such situations in your own handlebar survey. So what can you do about it? A couple of ideas of what you can do. First, think about placing strategically bollards at certain locations which stop through movement, right? So all that you've done is just one line of bollards which stop through movement of larger motor vehicles. It might still allow smaller motor vehicles to pass through and you can find design solutions to even stop smaller motor vehicles like motorcycles to, to reduce their speeds. But at the very least, you're not letting large vehicles directly go through, pass through. Instead, if somebody has to access that space, they might take a slight detour to access the same location. So you're not stopping anybody from accessing their property, just that you're making it not fast and making them take a detour. So that's one idea of what you could do. 
The second idea, of course, is looking at what can you do in terms of placing other kinds of traffic calming elements like tabletop crossings, regular frequent tabletop crossings along the stretch to reduce the speed of that section. So that's another possibility that you could look at. Third is to look at a variety of other solutions like chicanes. Chicanes is essentially zigzag, narrow zigzag roads which, which are shared spaces where it becomes even safe, like, like uh, our colleague from Isol was mentioning how small children often find it difficult. If you were to create something like this, you can see even small children can start going out on streets and, and spending time outdoors more happily. And gradually they could start venturing into the larger streets as well. So that's about traffic calming, essentially making that whole area slower and calmer for local activities rather than fast moving traffic going through that area. Next, next, let's finally look at other design elements. Here, one of the most important design element that we all have to look at is intersections. Oftentimes, intersections are like large football grounds, right? As in, it, it becomes really difficult for a cyclist to negotiate a large intersection. So the first step that you would do is to make the intersection compact. So extend the footpaths, the sides, to make the physical footprint of the intersection, the junction, smaller. Next, make sure that you have safe crossings for pedestrians from all the points along desired lines. So make it as straight as possible, connecting one end to the other end. Finally, when, it look, when you look at cycle tracks, Think about adding elements like along with the segregated cycle track that you've created. Uh, for example, in this east-west corridor, you see a cycle track, but in the north-south, you do not have a cycle track. But along with the cycle track, include elements like a bicycle box so that the cyclist can come right up to the front and get space to queue up before the motor vehicle traffic. So that when the signal turns green, it's the cyclists who are moving ahead of them ahead of the motor vehicle traffic, making it safer for the cyclists. So first step, make it compact to ensure that there is safe crossing for pedestrians. And finally, look at how you can create elements like bicycle boxes for cyclists to queue up in front so that it becomes safer for them. Again, we will have a bunch of other minor details, important but other details included in the design guidelines that we send you. Second ensure that there are safe crossing opportunities. It's not enough to create a single long corridor for cycling because you might actually have, your purpose might be on the other side of the street, right? So if you have no points of crossing, then the cyclist doesn't have the ability to actually go to their destination, which is on the other side of the road. So ensure that there are frequent crossing opportunities our recommendation is have a, free, a crossing opportunity at least every 200 to 250 meters, which means four to five crossing opportunities every kilometer. And wherever you have a crossing opportunity, ensure that there is safe space in the center, a refuge where a cyclist can stand with their cycle safely. So that's about creating safe and frequent crossing opportunities. Then look at the riding surface itself. Uh, Oftentimes we've seen that cycling surfaces are, are, are created using things like paver blocks, which are extremely difficult to ride on for a cyclist. So what you wanna ensure, especially when you're creating permanent infrastructure is provide an even surface, uh, either asphalt, it could be colored asphalt, even regular asphalt, but asphalt, which is very well laid or even concrete for that matter, uh, which is even and continuous and not undulating like paver blocks. Also look at issues like drainage, which we will get into in the detailed guidelines. Lastly in this, make sure that you're lighting it right, both for road safety, but also for personal security. Because what happens often is that there is a single light and that light is extremely tall. Uh, and that tall light then gets obstructed by trees, which are often shorter than the light itself, which means that the area where pedestrians are and cyclists are becomes very dark and dingy. And therefore you don't, and you don't want it to be dark and dingy, both from a road safety perspective, but also from 
personal security. So what you need to do is to also think about a series of more human scale lighting, which then lights up the area where the cyclists and the pedestrians are. So think about not only lighting for the carriageway, but also lighting which is appropriately placed, uh, is not obstructed by trees and lights the area of pedestrians and cyclists as well. And with that, I'll, I'll end this section of design. This was just to give you a sneak peek of what the, the design elements are. And we'd be happy to discuss further about your ideas on how to design and take it forward. One of the things that we would start offering from now onwards as you start designing your detailed plans is between the workshops that we have once every three weeks, we would also have design reviews uh, where we offer you the opportunity. If you, send you, if you were to send your designs to us, uh, we will pick up a few of those and do a review of the designs that you prepare. And we could have a design review session with multiple cities to learn from each other on your designs. So that offer is there from us. Uh, this is the end of this section of the presentation. Uh, I'd like uh, all of you to take a moment. We will launch a small little poll uh, for you to uh, tell us whether you found this particular session useful uh, and what you'd like to see different. So there goes the poll. Uh, if you think the session was great, rate it a very good. If you think it was good, but not that great, a three or a two or a one, depending upon what you think. So have you gotten responses? Yes, Shreya, just running the poll for a couple of seconds more. Sure. Yeah, we have around we have more than a hundred responses now, and uh, most of them are uh, very good and good. So yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and please feel free to send us feedback either via WhatsApp or email or whatever means that you would have to tell us whether the guidance that we are giving you is good for you and how useful it is. And I'd now hand back the presentation to Ashwati, uh, who will take us to the last section on building the momentum to ensure that we continue to have the support that we have from citizens. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Shreya. Prior to that, shall we take some questions that has come up with the- no, uh, absolutely, absolutely. All right. So, so um, one of the questions, Shreya, as also uh, you know, we heard from Aizwal, uh, was about the fact that you know the, the very old city, like uh, here is a question from Tisnil Valley. The question is that Tisnil Valley is a very old city and it has many narrow roads. And how can we implement uh, such interventions in these contexts? So, uh, like, uh, like you saw, there are two ways of doing things, which is one, on fast, on large arterial streets where you might have fast moving traffic, what you need to do is segregation. But we fully well understand that in many, many cities in India, you may not actually have large arterial streets, wide streets. Instead, the traffic is moving through narrower streets. There's older establishment. So what you should primarily focus on is traffic planning at the local level to calm the entire neighborhood, to make sure that it's safe for cyclists and motorists to coexist in that area. And a very, very key element of that is managing parking. Without managing parking, we would not be able to actually create safe cycling environment. So a, a very important step is, and it might seem odd that for the sake of cycling, what you're doing is actually parking. But unless you manage parking, you cannot actually do good cycling. And we will be giving guidance on, on also how to get parking management right. Uh, but that would be my suggestion on how to handle it. So building on that, Shreya, we uh, got a question also uh, from Mr. Tarang. And he asked if it is advisable to create a multi-purpose track which can act as a cycle track for particular time slots, like early morning or other non-peak hours? Sure. So, you know, it's possible that you have cycle tracks which are time, uh, 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 which work in certain times of the day. But do keep in mind that the point here is 
is that you want to make cycling safe for people when they want to cycle. So if when they want to cycle is during the peak hours and you do not have a safe cycling environment for cyclists, they will not embrace cycling. And so while it's perfectly fine for you to look at temporary or, or interventions which are at certain times of the day, for example, in a school area, maybe what you would like to do is during the morning hours when children are coming to the school and in the evening, you might create a temporary intervention. Perfectly valid. But do keep in mind that you want to create the intervention or the intervention should be available for cyclists when they want it, not when it is easy for you to implement. Sure. Yeah. So uh, it should not be, oh, I have lots of traffic in the evening and I don't care about what the cyclist, what happens to the cyclist during that hours. But instead think about, does the cyclist need also that space in those hours? And if yes, make sure that it's safe for the cyclist. So, uh, Shri, next we have a question from Pasi Ghat, and the question is that how can we promote cycling in hilly areas? Sure. Uh, and I'd actually like to pose that question because honestly, it's not as if we have figured out everything. And we do uh, realize that the solutions that you might have in hilly towns might be different. And we are happy to have a discussion maybe separately with all the hill towns who are part of the cycling challenge. And it's great that we have so much representation from the Northeast and from other hilly towns from across the whole country. And we'd like to make sure that whatever guidance that we're giving uh, is useful to make sure cycling is safe in all kinds of terrains. Uh, one, one key issue that I'd like to bring here, uh, of course, is that especially in hilly terrains, sometimes you might have to get off your cycle and go on a staircase because between various levels, you have staircases. And one of the key interventions that cities have done is make sure that you have a small, narrow little ramp right next to the, on the staircase so that you could roll your bicycle more easily rather than having to lift your bicycle up. So when you have this narrow ramp going up alongside you on the staircase, okay, you can also take your bicycle up. So that's a very design, a, 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 a design specific to hilly towns or how do you negotiate uh, staircases. Sure, Shreya. Thank you for that. So um, we have a question from uh, Mr. Burry, and I think we have, you know, you have uh, sort of mentioned it about vendors already, but uh, just to maybe, you know, add a little more emphasis. So most of the roads are encroached by roadside vendors, illegal encroachment. To remove this encroachment is a very, very difficult process, he says. And he asks, what are the strategies uh, different authorities should embrace to remove this encroachment and that it's a major hindrance on uh, cycling smoothly. Absolutely. So after parking, the second biggest hindrance for both pedestrians and cyclists is vending. And by, so vending is like a, is a bittersweet thing. Like, you know, it has value because it makes the area active, but at the same time, it also makes it difficult when it is unmanaged. Uh, it tends to make it almost impossible for you to walk or cycle with convenience. And therefore the step that you need to take is how do you manage vending? So vending is important, but what do you do? There are a variety of uh, ways in which vending has been managed in different parts, but the best way is to also think about them as an important stakeholder, bring them on board and think about creating self-managing cooperatives. So if when you create a cooperative, you say there are a certain number of slots which are available here, start formalizing the slots where you can vend and let the cooperative then manage and self enforce rules. So you might still need a little bit of support from the government or from the municipal corporation or from the SPV, but for the large part, you're trying to make the vendors association there responsible for ensuring that there is no encroachment. Sounds great. Things like these have been done in different parts in, in India itself. So multiple cities have actually created these vending cooperatives to have a certain level of control on the amount of vending that happens in that area and how it can be more efficient. Thank you, Shreya. So here is another question, and this is a, uh, quite a, you know, a, an, an important question, which is related to water logging. 
So, you know, uh, the, the questioner says that the most Indian roads are slight slopes, much higher in the center. And, you know, they reduce, uh, the, the slope actually reduces towards the cycle track. And during rains, the cycle track ends up becoming, you know, water It becomes, it becomes and, a river. Yeah. So, right? he, yeah. so the question is, how can we solve this problem? So how can we solve this problem? Uh, of course, you need to handle some water uh, drainage. Uh, oftentimes, what cities do is to create rather expensive stormwater drainage systems. And in some cases, you might actually need stormwater drains. So I'm not saying you don't need stormwater drains. But I would also suggest or think about localized stormwater solutions. These could be stormwater uh, you know, recharge pits right at that location. So if you were to come to where I live in Chennai, the corporation actually has created a series of stormwater uh, recharge pits along the entire stretch at the lowest point, at the lowest edge of the street. So earlier, by our street used to get waterlogged very easily. And now there is no water logging because the water goes actually into the stormwater uh, uh, recharge pits, which is a win-win solution because you're raising the water table and you're also ensuring that the cycle track is no longer submerged. The second thing to think about is, are there localized parks, et cetera, which can become large scale uh, recharge pits? So can you somehow direct using localized solutions, localized drains, if you will, even surface uh, drainage mechanisms to get this water channelized towards lower lying parks, which can take a large amount of water and recharge there. So, an, an extremely important point. Thanks for raising it. And this is what you need to do. Yeah, that was a question from the uh, city of Sagar. And now we have a question from Ms. Shubha. Uh, and the question is that in case of putting cycle box in front of the motorized vehicles uh, at junctions, because it is something new that, you know, like Indian cities have not tested it so much. So uh, does the safety risk actually get increased is a question that she asked. Is it not better to have the cycle crossing along with the pedestrians? So uh, it's a question of, see, you know, cyclists are actually a little closer to being uh, like a motor vehicle in many senses. Uh, you know, a, a pedestrian is far more agile in the way they walk as compared to a cyclist who typically is faster. Uh, you know, oftentimes cyclists are at a speed of somewhere in the 12 to 15 kilometers per hour range, even Average cyclists are in that range. And faster cyclists, of course, can go more or less at the same speed as motor vehicles. Uh, so you need to think about them similar to motor vehicles, but segregated and with a certain priority. And therefore, what you do when, when you create a cycle box, and this has been quite successfully tested in many places, uh, you ensure that the cyclists are all in front. They are a little slower than motor vehicles, and therefore, they get a head start because right in the front, also, when cyclists need to take a right turn, it's much safer for them to come and accumulate in a, in a bicycle box in front uh, and take that right turn ahead of motor vehicles than trying to mingle with motor vehicle traffic to take a right turn. Uh, where cyclists from the left need to go to the rightmost side, a cycle box is very successful and very useful for the safety of cyclists. And of course, those who are going straight along continue to be straight in, in that space, in the straight space. Thank you, Shreya. And uh, before we close our session, one last question. So uh, this is with respect to the, the question reads that where we can break the cycle track momentum. So I, I think what is being, uh, you know, what, what they're trying to convey is that when the cycle track is not continuous, and when it does break in sections, considering because our street bits are uh, varying across, which is the case in most Indian cities, what kind of minimum lengths should we look at? So what should be our approach when we design a street where there is a lot of variation in bits? So what happens with having discontinuous cycle tracks is that the cyclist no longer trusts the cycle track. So if you cannot have continuous lengths of cycle tracks, uh, you know, I, I'd say that you know, there's, there's no absolute number there, but for example, if you do not have a cycle track which is continuous for about a kilometer, and you have say 100 meters here and a break of 50 meters, and again 100 meters there, the cyclist no longer uses the cycle track. It becomes just a dead space. The cyclist much prefers being on the carriageway, moving next to the traffic, 
which means what you need to do is actually traffic calming and not just a series of discontinuous cycle tracks and ensure that the cyclist is safe along with the rest of the traffic. Sounds good, Shreya. And um, I think, you know, uh, these are some of the major questions that we have. We do have some other thoughts like, could we make television advertisements, uh, you know, of cycling to uh, improve awareness, uh, to implement? Uh, yeah, that's what you're going to talk about next, right? Yeah, and, and we also have some comments, uh, you know, where uh, some of our uh, participants have said that if you don't have a network, um, or off cycle track or cycle safe streets, then cycling ridership will not increase. So these absolutely, are the absolutely. As in, think about how it is for a motorist. A cyclist is like a motorist, but just a better kind because they don't have a motor. But if you do not have a continuous network for a motor vehicle to reach from point A to point B, they'll not be able to go, right? So whatever irritates you as a motorist also irritates the cyclist. And along with that, the motorist herself or himself is also an irritation because they can make it unsafe for the cyclist. So think about a cyclist as if they are on a motor vehicle, just a little slower and just a little smaller, and they need to be taken care of. Thank you, Shreya. So I think we'll, you know, wrap up the, uh, the question answer session now. And yeah. as you mentioned, we will move into the building the moment section. Yeah. So we've been, you know, I, uh, first of all, I'd like to really once again, congratulate all the cities. Uh, I think all of you all have been doing a fantastic job uh, building momentum in each of your cities. And it's also clear with the kind of teams that you all have been having and the fantastic campaigns that each of you are running. So we're just going to take a step of how can we push this further? So in the uh, Cycles uh, to Freedom campaign that we had already run, what we noticed was that while we had a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, there, was, there was fantastic participation of all the cities, there were such great uh, stories that were being posted, but the truth was also that most of them were from cycling groups, cycling enthusiasts. Now, um, you know, as well as, uh, you know, some, some, some cities had also looked at children and uh, women, but we'd really like to put the vulnerable users at the forefront uh, in this particular campaign. So we're, we're going to encourage you all and uh, push you all to continue with this particular campaign. But right now, focus on the commuter cyclists, the cyclists who are going cycling every day, like being the daredevil, putting their life out there, fighting against the you know motorists um, and finding their way through. So if we could look at their stories, focus on women cyclists as well, because we 50% of our population are women. Uh, but when it comes to the cyclist numbers, you know, like uh, uh, we, we've also heard from the panelists that sometimes their participation is only as much as 20%. So can we look at how 50% of our population is given a little more, uh, a lot more focus as well? So here, what we're saying, number one, if you could get stories of uh, the cyclists uh, and, and how would you do that? So right here, what we're doing is sharing with you some ideas for the questions that you, you could ask these, um, uh, these users. One, you know, uh, things like, when did they get uh, their cycle? How many years have, been, have they been cycling for? What is some of their favorite memories uh, when they've been cycling? And um, what would you do if you didn't have the option of cycling? And what can the city actually do to improve uh, cycling? So these are some of the cues that we're giving you. And if you could actually reach out to these user groups as well, that would be fantastic. Now, as you all have, you know, many of you all have done a fantastic job with online uh, campaigns. Now, uh, offline campaigns have been slightly slow. And I do understand that, you know, with the coronavirus crisis, it would be a bit difficult as well. But we have seen some cities who have taken the step forward. You know, they are doing all of these um, uh, training clinics, um, uh, repair, the repair centers and uh, things like that. So here, what we would really encourage you all to do is if you could, again, uh, look at hosting cycling training camps. So like I said, even in your pilot neighborhoods and uh, uh, that you've selected for uh, the handlebar surveys and to design and test your pilot, it's a fantastic way to engage with your users uh, there. 
So next to your uh, pilot, you could look at closing a particular street or parts of the street. And you could encourage women and children and other beginners to cycle in a safe outdoor environment. They might be, they might have a fear, especially when there is fast moving traffic. So if you could look at how you can actually encourage them in, in those areas, that would be fantastic. So what are the main steps that we would like you to do? So here we would like uh, you to identify a prime location next to the pilot that you all have already identified. It gives you a great opportunity to build support for the pilot as well and build relationships with the community. Release an official circular about, uh, the, uh, about this particular uh, event that is coming up and spread the word to register for the event through social media. Um, include cycling groups and other experts to teach cycling. So the aim of this particular uh, initiative is to teach cycling to women and to young children as well. Um, use barricades, planters, bollards uh, to close the street and document the entire event and put the highlights um, of the post on your newspapers, on media, uh, etc. And, you know, uh, we have seen that cities like Kohima have done uh, cycle training sessions, but we've noticed that they've been an all uh, men session. And this time we'd really like to nudge and encourage cities to bring your women and your children up front. So this is what uh, you know we would like to ask um, uh, you in this particular part of our presentation. Um, next slide. So let me just look at uh, wrapping up what we've shared with you so far. So until the until the next workshop in the next three weeks, we would really like you all to document more information of your pilot and design your pilot stretches. Refine uh, the designs through the expert review session. So we encourage all of you all to share your designs and we would love to uh, you know, uh, review them very quickly. We post it online so other cities can also see what different cities have been doing and learn from each other. Um, organize community design reviews so that you know you take your uh, refined designs to your community, hear from what they have to say, and look at if you if there are inputs that can uh, be very very valuable because there would be and you know they, they, they are the ones who live in those neighborhoods and how your designs can be reviewed from their feedback as well. And last but not the least, keep the momentum going. It's been fantastic to see this momentum through uh, building the momentum campaigns. And until then, we have a bunch of things that we will be sharing with you. We will first share the presentation that we've made right now and a video of this particular workshop. We will share design solutions and implementation details as well. So things like, uh, you know, even some uh, minor uh, details like uh, for doing a tactical urbanism intervention, what might be the cost be, etc. I know that there are some of those sort of pieces <clears throat> also which might be running in your, um, uh, which might be a question that's being posed in your minds, and we will share such details with you. A perception survey form for outreach is very important for you to document the perception of cyclists in that neighborhood prior to the design. And hence, we will share that with you. A qualitative uh, survey template as well. A guide for site documentation. So in order to design your site, you will need to know what the right of ways are, what the obstructions are, etc. So what are the things that you need to uh, document? Uh, all of them would be shared with you as a, a brief template. We will also share templates for outreach. And we will give you uh, guidance on how you can use street mix as you are developing the designs in your, um, in, in your cities. So uh, this is what we have right now. Uh, thank you so much. And I'd really like, uh, we're gonna be posting a quick poll on this section as well. Um, kindly you know, share, with your, share your feedback on how our inputs on building momentum have uh, been helping you as well. And what your thoughts are, um, like the way we heard about having advertisements. If there are other such ideas, it'll be, it'll be uh, nice to hear that from you as well. So as we take uh, these reviews, let me just see if there are any more questions in this section.
so with respect to communications particularly there aren't uh, too many questions but uh, since i've noticed one more on the design piece itself i'm just going to highlight uh, that one so this is from uh, devanagiri and um, so we have a question uh, which is that they have planned a cycle track over paved surfaces and uh, in this case can we suggest some ideas to improve the paved surface to have a smoother surface for cycling shreya uh, why don't we get back to you so uh, you know we understand what you are dealing with and like we said uh, we would have design reviews so along with this question if you have other questions also about your design please share your designs with us and we will soon run these design review clinics where multiple cities not necessarily all of you uh, but who are is interested and is at that stage is welcome to join these design review clinics and we will answer specific questions after you submitted your design uh, for review yeah sure and so we have another question which is um, when is the last date for submission of the pilot and i would request uh, um, aditi to go back to the presentation date with the uh, deadline with, with the extended deadline so that it's clear to all our team members so to be very uh, clear to all of you out here the india cycles for change challenge submission date has been extended it has been extended up to december 14th and it is on december 14th that we would like you to share the pilots that you have uh, you know implemented both on the cycling corridor as well as in the cycling neighborhood so the different uh, unique pain points that you have resolved so all of those pilots we would really look, we look forward to your uh, you know uh, submission about that as well as your scale up proposal so uh, more details about you know the submission format and what the evaluation criteria will be will be shared with you shortly but until then the date itself has been extended to december 14 so we request you to uh implement the pilots uh by the end of october uh, so that you have at least a month to see the responses because you also need to do a monitoring and evaluation of your pilots to learn from these pilots right so i would say that the the you should aim for no later than having the pilot live by mid to late october so that you have enough time to do the monitoring and evaluation and consolidate that document that and put in your proposals because your proposals are due no later than december 14 uh, you got in nearly a six week or a seven week extension uh, make the most out of these seven six seven weeks uh, make sure that your pilots you've thought through you've gotten engagement with your community uh, so that it's success it there's a, there's a higher chance of it being successful but also remember that this is a test and in a test you might have certain components not succeed and the whole goal of it is for you to learn it's test learn and then scale so it's fine to make mistakes but don't repeat mistakes after you've learned from it try to make other mistakes rather than trying to do the same mistake so sure, there's also another interesting question yeah. um, and so this is about e bikes and the question is that whether e bikes uh, will be eligible in this challenge whether they should be allowed in the dedicated cycle track or on mixed traffic so it really depends on speed uh, you know if these are uh, e bikes which are pedal assist and are low speed in nature uh, then yes they can coexist with cyclists and that's what other cities have done across the world but if these are higher powered uh, motor only cycles which have no pedals then we should not consider them because they are, they are no longer cycles and the goal of this challenge is cycles for change not motorcycles for change thank you shreya thank you for that one and uh, we also have um, uh, so there's also a request from mr nareen who says that if we could share standards for cycle tunnel and underpasses more specific to the indian context 
Sure. Uh, you know, we, we can look at those, but do keep in mind that the best place for a cyclist and a pedestrian to be is on ground. It's the easiest place for them to be. Typically, the reason why you would do a cycling tunnel is to make uninterrupted motor vehicle traffic. And if that's the intention, I request you to not do it. But in certain cases where you're creating something like a cycling highway, where you do not want the cyclist to be interrupted, which has been done in multiple countries, uh, we will certainly share the details with you so that you could consider doing something like a cycling highway or a network of cycling highways in your city. Sure. And we also have another comment, which is that, uh, you know, uh, cycle training is a really fantastic idea and will make the project uh, a lot more inclusive. And on this uh, really good note from one of our panel, uh, from one of our listeners, um, we have no more questions. And uh, so, you know, uh, we're looking at closing this particular session. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone uh, for joining us uh, on for this particular workshop, the senior officials, uh, the engineers, the project management um, consultants, um, the community uh, partners from our cities and all those stakeholders who have joined us on YouTube. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Smart Cities mission. You, uh, Ashwati, I you know um, it's great that we also have viewers on YouTube. And if you have any questions on YouTube, we'd like to take those questions as well. We have a few minutes left. And uh, you know, if, if there are any questions, uh, can I ask our team to just look into those questions? Sure. Let me just take a second. Aditi Angi, if there are some questions, can you all uh, highlight them? Um, so Ashwati, someone has asked how safe are median cycling lanes? So uh, median cycling tracks have been tried in multiple places in the world and they've had various varying levels of success. Uh, the primary thing to keep in mind is that you need frequent crossing opportunities. Just having median cycle tracks is not enough. The second thing to keep in mind, especially in weather like Indian cities, which to a large extent uh, can be quite warm and also humid, uh, you would want to have tree shade. So sometimes median cycle tracks have been created in cities across the world where there is no shade whatsoever. So it makes it quite uncomfortable for cyclists. So yes, median cycle tracks are a possible solution, but ensure that there are frequent crossing opportunities so that people can get out of the median cycle track to reach whatever their destination is on the curbside on either side. And two, make sure that there is also, uh, it's comfortable with tree shade and lighting. Any other questions, Aditi? No, Shri, I think uh, we've covered most of them. Yeah, sure. So thanks a lot, all of you uh, who've uh, come in on Zoom or YouTube today. Uh, and please keep sending us your questions and we are there to uh, support you in whatever way we can uh, and keep up the great work that you're doing. It's great to see that India finally is cycling for change. Thank you. And before